Hey everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library podcast. This is episode 39, and today we are speaking with Ivanhoe Cambridge. Ivanhoe Cambridge is the real estate arm of Quebec Deposit and Investment Fund, essentially the Quebecers Pension Fund. They have $65 billion in assets under management, and we were lucky enough to sit down and have a conversation with the company's CEO, Natalie Pelidichev. How do you get to be the CEO of one of the world's largest real estate funds? What happens when a pandemic hits a pension fund? And where are the largest opportunities today? We talk about all this and more in today's episode. Please, as always, remember to rate, comment, and subscribe as it helps us create more content and then you never miss a single episode. Thanks for listening. everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library podcast. You know me, Damon Tamman Waller, you know my co-host Garrett McGilvery, and we are joined today by Natalie Palladichev, who is the president and CEO of Ivanhoe Cambridge. Uh, Natalie, welcome. Nice to Thank see you. you. Nice yeah. to see you too. Um, okay, can you, can you, like, we want to get these contextual questions out of the way. Can you tell us a tiny bit for the 1% of people who don't know about Ivanhoe Cambridge? What are you guys, what do you do? So Ivan Cambridge is the, the um, um, arm, um, real estate arm of uh, <clears throat> sorry, CDBQ. Uh, so we are dealing with the uh, Quebecers money. So it's a big responsibility because I can tell you that as soon as we disclose something, everybody reads it because it's, uh, it's everybody, everybody's money. So all the families of, of my employees are always my, uh, like my focus group about uh, what they think about what we do and the way we are uh, investing their money. So it's, uh, right. I, I think it's very important to say that before any other numbers, because I, I really was not um, able to figure that out before joining the company. But when you live in Montreal and when you deal with Quebecers money, that's something, you, you know, it's, it's the most important. Okay. Um, uh, so CDBQ is, is dealing with uh, 330 uh, uh, billion uh, dollars currently. The allocation in real estate is around 12 persons, which means that I have 42 billion in equity and 65 billion uh, uh, assets under management because we have obviously some uh, some leverage on that. Um, so it's um, yes, it's a big deal. Um, it's it's um, around 10 countries in which we are invested in. Uh, for the time being, we have let's say 25% of our assets here in Canada, which means 75% outside. So mm -hmm. even if we are based here in Montreal, and that is really uh, uh, where we, we want to, uh, uh, to flourish, uh, we need also to have some return coming from some other uh, uh, geographies and asset class that we can't find here in Montreal or in Canada. So that's why we, we have those 75% uh, invested outside. Uh, that's probably... Uh, the name of the game, and especially experiencing what we what we do now, right now with the pandemic, we really th think that the, this diversification was uh, really the right thing uh, to do, uh, yeah. and uh, and we want to do more in the future to be more resilient for a potential next next crisis or ne next downturn. Yeah, hopefully not another pandemic. No, <laughs> definitely not my preference. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. One one last context question. Can you can you tell us a little bit about like this is okay mag managing sixty four billion is it sixty four or sixty five assets under management yeah, something around there. Yes. Yeah. We're um, moving a lot. <laughs> but I mean, let's it, say sixty five. It's easy. A huge responsibility. Uh, I I was looking at your LinkedIn and it's. You know, it's you know it's a a boss when even the ten years ago is a, is something some incredible position. Can you can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you got to where you are and kind of coming up in the real estate business and um, mergers and acquisitions, uh, everything that that kind of got you here? Um, I started, in fact, in in finance, which is a path which is I would say the like the second way to access this kind of position. Uh, I would say that you, you, you can start with uh, 
brokerage or a really investment directly related to invest uh, to to real estate or you can start with finance which is probably a, a broaden way to look at the industry and that then uh, dive into real estate, which was my case. So I started in finance, which led me at a point to leave uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, I was a CFO of a subsidiary of Crédit Agricole in a, in a small island which calls uh, Réunion. So a very uh, interesting part of my life. And it's not an anecdote only for me because it was really a, a great management experience to try to implement new things with, uh, within a company which was not really used to this kind of transformation or reorganization. So I think it's probably where I start, started a kind of uh, skill, which is to, uh, to, to try to transform or, or, or adapt some organization. Then based on that, I, I got back to, uh, to Paris in uh, in 2000, and I started uh, three different experiences in uh, the public real estate sector. Uh, so, of course, very interesting in terms of, uh, I would say, education and uh, um, um, level of of demand of the of the people you are working with. Because every day you have a, a shareholder who is knocking at your door and say, "Okay, what about that? I'm not happy uh, with what you are doing with my money." They are never happy. So you can imagine that having this kind of conversation. Uh, leaves you to to leads you to be very demanding and, and very and and really trying to access the level of excellence that the shareholders require. So very for me, very good uh, education, very good training for the next steps of my career. Um, then um, uh, among those different experiences, uh, I. I think I have done probably everything in the real estate sector, all the scope, uh, coming from facility management uh, to property management, and of course at the other end of the of a spectrum, M&A investment. But it has been very important for me, and I would say it is currently probably the reason why I'm surviving, is because I have done all those jobs. So when I'm talking about um, I would say anything to anybody in this industry, they can't just lead me um, in a way I'm, uh, I would not be aware of. So uh, because, okay. yes, yeah, I, 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 at a point I was even in charge of a security company, uh, which was a part of the facility management department. So really, I, I've talked to different types of people, different profiles. So I, I can really tell you that now, because within Ivano, we are... Uh, managing directly some assets and we have also some partners and, and we do also some funds. So we help also the whole scope. It helps me a lot to have uh, done all those jobs in different environment with different types of, uh, of people and, and, uh, and counterparties. So for me, it's, uh, it's probably the reason why uh, when I moved to, uh, uh, to Montreal exactly five years ago, because I, I was uh, appointed, uh, appointed CFO of Ivano, uh, 3rd of August uh, 2015. So I moved here in Montreal with my uh, entire family, uh, three boys and my husband, so four uh, men uh, at home. <laughs> A lot of food in my fridge. You can imagine how much oh. I shop. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so when, when we moved here, I, I really felt that I could bring something to the company because of this uh, broad experience in a company which was really focused in investment and transactions that I could, I think that it could bring something else. So that's why I accepted to be CFO, which could seem to be a little bit uh, limited, but in fact, I thought that it was a good entry point to really try to uh, make things different within the company. It was really the uh, what Daniel Fournier, the, uh, the this previous CEO of the company, had in mind when he when he hired me and and asked me to come from uh, from France. I thought also I brought some diversity, and and maybe the two words of my mandate would be diversification and diversity, uh, mm -hmm. because I was a, a woman, obviously, uh, and because also because I was French, so I was bringing an right. international view, which was different to the company. So I was firstly CFO, then appointed president, and October 2019, appointed CEO of the company. Good timing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hey, you, so, had a nice, you had a good few months there. 
<laughs> so that once more, uh, after those uh, very extraordinary months that we have experienced, I can tell you that, uh, and it's right what I'm trying to explain to my own children or to the young people I, I try to talk very often to uh, within the company. I have some, uh, some WebEx regularly with uh, uh, the next gen, what I call the next gen, and we are yeah. really trying to work hard for them because I think that we are building the company for them and we are building also the cities for them. So it's very important to know what they are thinking about what we do uh, currently. So for me, it's it's very important to, to have that in, in mind all, all the time. And, and what I've experienced is that um, maybe it's, it's a good timing for what I call myself a generalist, even if I'm very real estate uh, focused, as you can imagine, because of those experiences which have been different, I think it, it it makes me in a in a more resilient position that uh, uh, that that some others uh, that some other managers. Uh, uh, so I think it's um it's probably a, a good timing for generalists as we experience a very good timing for experts uh, over the last years. Yeah, yeah. As we head into this kind of unpredictable landscape, it's it's good to be versatile for sure. Yeah, so it's good to have different. Uh, different angles to look at things, to question the things, and, and to have also a lot of tools within your box uh, to say, okay, what can I use? <laughs> and, yeah. and really to adapt yourself. You know, we talk a lot about agility, which seems to be a little bit uh, trivial now, cliche, but that's true. That's, that, that's probably the main characteristic of the people who are going to be able to go through this period. Right, right. Um. So Natalie, you, you talked a bit about that you when you came to this company, you had a strategy, you know, surrounded by diversification and diversity. Um, COVID might have changed a bit of that, but what was that strategy when you were when you're coming here? Finally, I don't think it has changed so much what we had in mind. The only thing is it it's that it has accelerated it. Because we thought that maybe mm. based on, on the diagnosis we, we have done over the last months, and especially we did a very uh, thorough um, diagnosis of the macro trends of the environment last autumn for our uh, four years business plan. And I think that we really defined uh, the, the main pillars of our strategy once more based on the uh, observation of our uh, landscape. Uh, I think they are still very true and probably more than ever. Uh, you know, probably the, the first one was uh, that uh, the, the, there was some disruptions. There were some disruptions in, in some of our uh, uh, activities, of course, shopping centers. So obviously what we just experienced is just emphasizing what we had in mind, but uh, the emerging uh, uh, e-commerce business was already something that we had in our uh, background and yard uh, uh, last year. Second thing, uh, the traditional asset, I would say office asset class was also something that we had to leave behind and we had to think about um, new buildings adapted to the new requirements, so more mm. flexible, more health dedicated. And I, I can tell you, I'm not inventing what I'm telling you today. It's really the words we use in our business plan uh, last October. So, uh, but once more, we didn't we didn't know that it was going to happen within the next months when we thought it was going to happen within the next years. So yeah. that's the big change. But, but you know, okay. those main trends, uh, because we have a big concentration in, in those two asset class, were already on the top of my priorities and tops of my, or tops of my list. So uh, I would say that um, we have not really seen anything new currently uh, or recently uh, based on this pandemic. but the acceleration, the pressure is really, really, uh, I would say, um, high. Uh, it's really tough because we, you know, we, we have to change um, not 65 billion because what we said at last year when we do this, uh, we did this diagnosis is that two thirds of our portfolio were in line with those macro trends, but even one third of 65 billion is a big amount to. Uh, to recycle. So uh, the one, thing one is that being, being the retail and office component or yes, 
a part of the retail, a part of the office. So not of okay. not of not of them. Because for example, because you're based in Toronto, you you probably had the opportunity to uh, to see uh, what we are developing for CIBC with the CIBC uh, uh, Square, which is yeah. really with the very heart of uh, Toronto, directly related to the means of transportation transportation because it's built over the station so if you look at this project that was perfect in october that's probably even better now because it's really the the, the, the building that everybody would like to have now so it unfortunately it's not delivered yet but it's in progress mm -hmm. but it's it's exactly what all the companies are still looking at because now we know that it's going to be probably a kind of hybrid, hybrid way to work between this kind of offices, very, I would say, value added for people. You know, it's, it's not anymore uh, a commodity. Office should bring more than that. And if you are just bringing walls and floors, then you're sure that you are going to fail. But when we designed CIBC with our first uh, tenant, uh, CIBC themselves, we had in mind something more ambitious and more future uh, uh, projected. So uh, we're very happy with this kind of development and we have some, other, uh, some others in our portfolio or in our pipeline, which are really in line with what we, we, we would expect even after our during this pandemic. But besides that, we have more, I would say, traditional premises, traditional towers, which are going to be more obsolete, uh, uh, I would say more quickly obsolete than what we had yeah. in mind. So this one third that we have to, uh, to, to yes, uh, recycle is, uh, is for us, yes, the, the top of our preoccupation. Once more, it was the case already a few months ago, but now is is uh it's more than ever the case so it's it's more question of timeline than a question of volume that we have to uh to deal with uh so th so that's why i think that this uh and and you know it's it's i would say it's kind of coincidence it's because i was appointed in october so i, I really wanted to make this diagnosis of the portfolio of the entire environment. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know that it was going to be so useful to, to, to do that. So it was really because I was appointed. So I wanted to do something. I wanted to have a kind of, uh, of basis for my strategy, for my mandate, and to, be, uh, to have some uh, targets. Uh, so based on that, uh, we, we are, I would say, we, we felt a little bit finally in advance when this pandemic started because we had already this kind of, uh, of new strategy and new guidances uh, which seemed to be perfectly uh, consistent with, where, with what we were seeing. So mm -hmm. um, we, we turn, uh, I would say, some weaknesses of our uh, uh, situation into, uh, I would say, into assets, in, into uh, advantages. So uh, I can I can still feel like that after uh, five months of being uh, stuck in my in my room. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, uh, that's really interesting. So okay, so can you can you talk to me a little bit of like when when the pandemic happened? I know like I I work at Colliers, right? It's just multiple deals being either kicked out, extended, or a few things dying. Um, it was kind of just like all hands trying to figure this out, a lot, a lot of tough conversations with clients, um, and we've kind of navigated our way through that. What does that look like for a pension fund? And like, like, are, what are you guys discussing in the all hands meeting? And then I know this is a few questions in a row, but like, how do you adjust your strategy quickly when real estate is a, is a tough you can't make those moves like you can in the financial markets. Um, I, I would say that the most difficult thing was to really uh, define was what I would say short term moves and long term moves. So yeah. not to to try to grasp everything and to do everything at the same time, because we, we knew that it was uh, very volatile and that maybe if we chose to do something in March, it would be completely uh, stupid. Uh, it's, it would sound completely stupid in May. So we, we really tried and I think it's probably an advantage of, of uh, 
being a pension fund is that time is more your ally than uh, to hedge fund or to a private equity firm when it's right. everything is very short term. At least we knew that uh, we we had some time to really figure out what was uh, the right move to to make instead of just moving for moving. So uh, so I think it was really important. And even in terms of management, we were pretty clear at the beginning with the team saying, OK, we are going to make offensive moves, defensive moves and prospective actions. And not everybody is going to do everything. So right. we're going to have to really have some focus on on those three pillars which are going to be the basis of the of our adjustment. So that's why long term, once more, based on this diagnosis, we, we were pretty clear about the fact that what we were doing were the, the right things. And, and we, we, we could just go on on those big trends like expanding our portfolio in logistics, uh, expanding our portfolio in residential, and trying to be more active in the way we were adjusting our uh, a part of our office portfolio and a part of our uh, 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 retail portfolio. So that was really the way we looked at that. So I think it's very important. And once more, we I thought that we were a little bit privileged because we didn't have all those conversations that some of our peers should have with the banks to uh, uh, renegotiate the covenants, to renegotiate the financings. We didn't have to do that. That was pretty clean on the balance sheet mm -hmm. side within our financing and of course with the relationships with our shareholders where we were able to have some money, some new capital at the beginning of the year. Uh, we still did some transactions during this first half year. We did 4.5 billion. So even if it seemed to be less than usually 4.5 billion is a big amount of money. And, right. and, and, and that was both uh, um, sales and, uh, uh, and acquisitions. And, and those two parts were really once more in line with the big trends. So that was that was good for us in terms in terms of humor or an atmosphere within the company. So once more, the, the most difficult thing for us and for everybody was really to accelerate. And because we were in a transformation phases, we had to accelerate this transformation. And that that's probably not my uh, preferred part of what I had to do during this uh, this period because I had to make um, difficult decision, tough decision. Uh, I had to uh, to let some people go. I had to cut uh, some uh, uh, some I would say simplify some processes. Uh, so th that was not definitely not that was not the best part. But finally, after those six months, and because we are able to to feel a kind of rebound or, uh, already I, I think that it was the right thing to do but we we had to make tough decisions which um which was i, I would say not the the tradition of uh, of a pension fund especially canadian pension fund when you see things are more smooth uh, most of the time so i think we did that right even to the people which were concerned because it was not about them it was not about their skills because they were completely adapt adapted and they were completely perfect for the period we experienced but now we have different challenges and right. we need different profiles so uh, i think it's it's very important to uh, to know that because it's very respectful for those people and it's also because we have to look forward because we are building uh, the the um, the company the profit for the next years because we are a pension fund right. so you know it's it's where you feel once more this responsibility because we can't just say okay it doesn't work and i'm just giving up and i'm just waiting no we you can't do that you have to think about once more the very short term but you have to think also about the fact that the retirees you are working for they are thinking about their retirement in five years ten years and you have to build this return Right. So, so that's why sometimes it leads you to make difficult uh, decisions. But that's right. that's part of the job. Okay. So offense, you're getting into more multifamily logistics. Defense, kind of thinking strategically about the retail and office uh, positions that you have, and then dealing with uh, how you're kind of managing through this internally. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Okay, Natalie. 
this is this is uh, this is one question that I like. This has really been plaguing me. Like, they're printing so much money globally. Um, the U.S., you know, Canada's handing out a lot of checks um, everywhere you look. How does this change how uh, you guys are thinking about your real estate assets? Are you thinking that the values are going to be inflated? Do you dive in more? How how does that influence you guys? Um, firstly, uh, we used to have, um, I would say, conservative uh, leverage policy. We have around 45% of LTV. Uh, we, we want to stick to that. So that, that's why we are really, uh, I would say, uh, 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 careful and cautious about uh, the uh, the balance sheet, the two sides of the balance sheet, not only the assets, but uh, the liabilities too. So I think we started uh, this pandemic with the right numbers. So no big pressure on that. When, when once more, some of our peers experienced that. So that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that, that's good. Uh, second thing uh, is if we look forward, um, I think that, because of all this liquidity, which is really overwhelming uh, all the markets, cash is not going to be a good thing to have. So, uh, so I think that it's even if we don't see that immediately because of the, I would say the most obvious things, which are the fact that there is nobody in the offices and there is and the shopping centers were closed. Besides that, this asset class seems to be attractive if you want to do some yield because what are you going to do with your money if you're an investor generalist investor uh, once more cash not great idea because it's like devaluating because of all this liquidity which is uh, uh, everywhere um, um, fixed uh, fixed um, uh, whatever bonds whatever mm -hmm. it's it's minus something and it's it's yeah. now minus something on the long term so i i really think that it's very in favor once more on the midterm not in the next weeks but on the midterm it's very in favor on of infrastructure because of the current yield attached to that and real estate because mm -hmm. of the tangible roots that those investments are so I, I really think that once more, we have to be very focused on the main trends and not panicking on the short term, even if it's going, we're going to have a kind of, of course, impact on the values. And we have that already at the end of, of June. But we, we should think. Uh, I would say beyond that. So that's that's complicated because you can imagine that, uh, of course, you have the pressure and people are looking at the current figures and say, okay, that's not enough, that's not good. But if you think once more midterm, you can really think that uh, real estate is um, is not a bad way to uh, to invest your money. And, and and once more, especially if you think what I pretend that um, that that it, it, it's a new real estate or it's a real estate which is really integrated uh, what we see so we are not stuck with the traditional pattern just try to replicate the uh, previous recipes expecting the same outcome now we are very aware that we have to do something different but if we do differently then i'm pretty sure that the outcome is going to be positive and having uh, this kind of asset in a portfolio really makes sense Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry, one one more before Garrett, before you go. Um, okay. Now this is a, just a question for personal finance. Maybe it's different than um, what Ivanhoe is doing. It's hard to predict the future, but if you have some money, I want to buy a small apartment building or something, some sort of asset. Do I do it now in six months or like when when do you decide obviously cash is bad to have we were just talking about that what how are you guys thinking about timing is it is it going to get worse is it going to get better for the real estate markets i i would say if if you have a vision if you have a conviction in one asset class you it, i don't think it's worth waiting so uh because especially if you're if, if it's your personal like it. money you do not have mark to market so you don't really care what is going to uh 
what the value is going to be at the end of the year as soon as you think that the cash flow is okay, that it's the, the kind of investment you like. So I really think that it's based on the convictions. Besides that, you can, of course, be, I would say, smart and opportunistic. And then you can build some convictions based on the discount. So for those, you have to wait because we don't see so many distressed assets for the time being. And probably because of what I said about the money, which is still very attractive to the industry. So nobody is really seeing, and I'm, you know, I'm talking to everybody, of course. And uh, even the, 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 I would say the biggest one, which are always the best to find those opportunities, they don't see so many right now. So if, if you want to be opportunistic and add some diversity to your convictions, then you have to wait a little bit. But once more, I think that you can just uh, play the game of knowing what you want to have, what you want to have not only at the end of, of the year, but what you want to have, to have in five years, 10 years, and then being smart and add some other things on the way. Yeah. Uh, but for, for those, you have to wait because really, in, even in a market like London, which is facing pandemic, Brexit, you would think that you would find a lot of things very attractive to buy. That's not even the case. Mm. So, so, you know, e and e even in, in uh, the so-called um, emerging markets, you don't see that either. So for the time being, pricing are stuck. So of course there is kind of pressure on the immediate value for people are, which are mark to market like we are. Mm -hmm. But once more, if, if you do that on the patrimonial way, if you have convictions, you know, it's an industry where when you can't, you shouldn't change your mind from one a half year to the other. Because if you do right. that, that at a point, you're getting crazy. And okay. I don't think that a balance sheet would make sense. So um, think about, um, yes, the design and, and stick to the design. Okay, sorry, last final follow up on that. What are you waiting for? If there is one, obviously you guys are currently investing. If there's one thing where you're saying, okay, maybe there's going to be some awesome opportunities here. Where, where is that? I really think that the best opportunity for everybody would be to have a vaccine or treatment. Ah, okay. I, I right. really think <laughs> to, right, to, be right. to be honest, I, I, I'm, it's, it's complicated to think about the future without uh, more information on this side. So I really think that it would be the, mo the, the biggest opportunity. On the other side, you know, I think that uh, we have some firepower. We have a big company, big balance sheets, solid balance sheets. So opportunity for us would be more to, at a point, being able to grasp a part of the big thing. So on the short term, we are going to be to do small, probably because of this volatility and because of we don't see any distress. So we just, we prefer to go on of uh, uh, using our platforms in logistics, for example, to develop existing land banks, to uh, to buy some and extend a little bit our, uh, our platform. So we're going to go, to go on like that in the next month, I think. Yeah. But at a point, and I, I I'm I'm not I'm not cynical, so uh, I I don't I don't hope that some people are going to suffer a lot in in a half year. But nevertheless, we, we think that uh, some are struggling, probably less than in 2008. So that's why we shouldn't take 2008 as being the example, because at that time, and because of my age, I can talk you about it. I talk to you about it. Uh, the the uh, real estate sector was less institutionalized, more debt, more panicking people. Now, mm -hmm. people are stressed that they are not panicking. And I don't see really anybody panicking, even if it's really extraordinary when you think about it. So it should be a mess. And it's not. People are really, um, yes, once more, they are looking at their 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 the finance and they they probably the, the first day they they heard the the word pandemic they rushed to their banks and say okay we are going to face difficulties in covenants let's renegotiate it right now so it's right. what they did but still some are struggling and the more it's going to uh, to be like that the more they are going to have problems to deal with whatever it calls whatever issues balance sheet side shareholders so 
I think, and maybe the, the um, and I'm definitely not hoping that it's going to happen, but I really think that what could make a major difference is if at a point there is no more liquidity. So if at a point we experience a credit crisis, then it could be another world for a lot of people. But okay. I'm not expecting that, not for them, uh, not for them either for me, but that's something that we, we, we have in mind. So we are very, uh, very careful about it. But once more, we could play a game um, within, I would say, the, the, uh, the atmosphere where there are just few players. So the big players, which are really able to, uh, to deal with sophisticated, big uh, uh, opportunities because there are less competition, especially in the environment. So maybe we, 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 we have to be ready for this kind of opportunity. So in, in the offensive uh, part of our uh, team or prospectic uh, prospection, uh, we should be ready for that. Hmm. Okay. Um, so now it's switching gears just slightly away from, you know, potential credit crisis and lockdown of society. Um, <laughs> you, you talked about, you know, UK potentially not being favorable, emerging markets not necessarily having those, you know, type of red hot opportunities that people might think that might be there. Where are you seeing these potential opportunities, geographically speaking? I think Europe is still attractive, whatever we say about it, uh, because of the, I would say, the potential of the industry itself. So it's not related to the macro, it's more related to the fact that the equilibrium between supply and demand is still in favor of, uh, of supply. So there are still a lot of things to do. For example, we were talking about logistics and industrial. The, this asset class in Europe is far, far behind what we see in the in, in US, for example, where it's more sophisticated, where more organized, structured, and so on. In, in Europe, it's still a lot of um, family offices, small companies, small portfolios, not really big platforms, once more very organized. So, uh, so I really see that, uh, or, uh, residential, for example, residential. There is no REIT, uh, no public company in residential in in, uh, in 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 some European countries, like France, which is the market mm -hmm. I know. No, not at all. I can oh. tell you that I'm the only one who tried an IPO in residential in 2006. <laughs> I failed, <laughs> but <laughs> nobody has tried since 2006. Can wow. you imagine that? So. So you see that there is still some potential in terms of really building uh, uh, an organized uh, asset class in, in some, uh, some sub-asset classes. So I think it, that's why I see a lot of potential. Uh, US, US is complicated on, on the short term because of the elections. So all the volatility attached to that. Right. Uh, and also because there is less potential once more in, in, because of the of the supply which is quite huge in everything <laughs> so uh, uh so we see that uh secondly i think uh, as you know we, we're very keen on our residential so we try to expand this residential uh market for example we we're very uh happy with uh, uh, an investment we made last year in uh, manufactured homes mm. so when you think about it you say okay it's not really sexy but in fact it's really sexy in terms of cash flow <laughs> yeah yeah it's and security of provision of a, of a real estate yield but that's very interesting and and in fact it's really adaptable to with the kind of needs we see right now and especially after the pandemic uh we try to expand also with uh, uh student residences uh in in france uh with grestar which is uh, one of our favorite partners in residential so uh so you you know we we used to be more traditional in what we were looking at in terms of residential and we try to expand that. So I think that's probably in terms of geography, Europe, in terms of uh, asset class, extending residential. And, and of course, uh, yes, uh, the last mile in logistics. And it's what I like very much about our portfolio is because we do both last miles and big boxes. So we have really the whole spectrum.
And in terms of diversification, I think it's very, um, very appropriate, very relevant. Mm -hmm. You know, getting back to diversification and diversity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Quickly, wh why are there no REITs effectively in, say, France for like apartments and stuff like that? Tax reasons. Just tax it's, reasons. It's, ah. Yes, because uh, I, I remember, I, even if it's uh, it, it seemed to be a long time ago, but I really think that uh, the uh, what I heard from the, the for example, American asset managers at, at that time could be exactly the same. Tax environments changing too quickly, too often. And, and as you know, it has a, a big impact on everything which is related to residential. So that's probably the main, the main reason. But I th at a point, I think we're going to, um, to, to go beyond that. But um, we have to be patient a little bit. But we are very... Um, Yes, we, we as you know we have a a big uh, uh, big team in Europe. Uh, we have 25 uh, people in Europe, uh, in Paris, London, and Berlin. Uh, so we have quite a um, um, yeah, smart and and very local point of view about what we could do there. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. You, you talked about sort of expanding your your residential portfolio to obviously including stuff like student residents. Like, what are your thoughts on some of the, the slightly more bleeding edge type of stuff like co-living? Mm. Mm. You know, <laughs> I think that the answer is a kind of mix of all those things, like co-working, co-living, co-something. You know, mm. we, we signed a, a, um, a, um, a partnership with, uh, with uh, WeWork, um, almost two years ago, which would seem to be far away, uh, we're still happy with it because it was the way to integrate the disruption within our teams. So it's mm. it's like my uh, uh, <laughs> masochistic way of doing things. Sometimes when you force, when you, you, you want to force yourself to do something, you, you just have to do it. So it was the way for us to think differently about leasing, about flexibility about not having only single tenant towers right. so i i'm really happy that we have done that even if for the time being it's uh, it's just two investments we did we did because of the um of course some other uh, explanations but that's not the point but that that's still very relevant because it helped us to to be more aware of what was happening think about what i said about the fact that as this asset class is very relevant if you're aware of the fact that it's not going to be the asset class that we used to have over the last 50 years. Right. You know, sometimes I say, I say to, uh, um, to, 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 to the teams, I really think that real estate is very conservative and traditional. And, and, and not only because of, uh, of the kind of investment we do, but everything. It's... You know, I was surprised when I moved to Montreal to see that people, finally, I knew probably 80% of my uh, new environment because that was more or less the same. Same people, same ways to do things. And, and, and because we, we were so success, successful doing that, and I'm using the preterite because it, it's not, a, it could be a mistake, a ling language mistake, but it is not because I really think that it's not going to work anymore. We mm. have to change things. And it's, it's, we are more selling like kind of collection of services now than just leasing premises. Right. So if we don't understand that, and if we don't in integrate the fact that it's less and less a B2B uh, industry, but more and more a B2C industry, then we are going to fail. So that's why I think it's a, it's a profound transformation. So I don't think that everything is going to turn into working, co-working, co-living, but a part of it is going to change into that. And you have to know it. It doesn't mean that you're going to do it yourself because we are going to be focused on, on some strategies. We're not going to do everything because if we do that, then we're going to fail everywhere. But at least you have to be aware of that. You have to integrate that in your, it's like a intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence and to try to transform it into strategies. And then, okay, as, as soon as you know that it exists, then you can decide to not do it, but you have to be aware that it exists. Right. So I think it's the way to think about it. Mm. Um, okay. 
Natalie, so now we're we're getting near the end. Um, and this is actually kind of one of my, we still have so many questions that, that uh, we'd love to ask you. So maybe we can do it in this format and do kind of like a firing line. Maybe that's a bad word, but like just quick, quick, quick questions. And you don't have to give long uh, okay. responses, Ready. just maybe one <laughs> sentence responses or something if you can. So okay. um, let me see here. Uh, what was your... What was your favorite deal that you've done at Ivanhoe Cambridge? Cambridge. So, so, I'm gonna quote two things. It's very complicated, and I hope that I'm not gonna have too many colleagues uh, listening to me because there is gonna be a lot of people. But I, I want to answer because if I say, "Oh, it's the everything," and so on, it, it doesn't. I think the, the deal we made in 2015, end of 2015, with Blackstone buying Titan uh, Village in New York. So these uh, 11,000 units of residential affordable housing mostly uh, is, is a big memory because of the size, more than 5 billion at that stage, because it was one of the first, because I was just joining the company. So I was so impressed by the power of this company. And then more recently, I like very much a project which calls Arboretum in the suburbs of Paris, which is um, uh, um, a building made out of wood. So it seems to be very, uh, <laughs> It's very mm. new, false, but not here in Canada. So I like this idea that we, we, we do something which seems to be very sophisticated with woods. So it's once more, it's like the two uh, two ends of the spectrum. Cool. Uh, um, so sorry, go ahead. Uh, who, do, who do you get advice from? Uh, a lot of people. I, I'm very extrovert, so that's why I'm not I'm not happy with this pandemic because it's it's what I used to say. It's not good for extroverts and shopping centers. So think about me. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, I I talk to a lot of people. I in fact I elaborate uh, by talking to people. So I need to have a lot of sending boards. So uh, firstly, um, I, I talk to a lot of people within my team to. Um, to have some other ideas. And I like the idea that since I joined the company and since I was appointed, I, I tried to make a mix with um, the, the existing team and some new people bringing in new ideas and diversity. So I like this idea, so it's very helpful. Um, I, um, I don't have a mentor per se, and I haven't have in fact, so it's more, it's more the, the, the different angles, which is for me, uh, helping me to, to elaborate something which is more comprehensive. Uh, I, my, my main uh, worry is to miss something. So, so that's why I think that you can't, you can't have everything just from one channel. You have to have uh, different ways, different people, not only in industry, I, I'm talking to really different people. And, and, and it's really the uh, the advantage of having my age and my experience. You have really good relationships in different countries, uh, different industries. So it's what I like the most from my my experience now is to to have this kind of a very uh, very qualitative trust between people, which enables you to to tell the reality, not on not uh, not something else. <laughs> so okay, like I appreciate that you're not name dropping, but do you? Are you calling the president of this country? Do you do you call? Do you are you are you good friends with Ray Dalio? Like I'm just picturing all the people who run the most powerful kind of companies and countries and uh, that we know of. Like now, it's it's definitely <laughs> the advantage of having this position is that you you can't talk to everybody. So really, uh, yes, that we over the last months we have been able to talk to uh, Larry Fink, John Gray, Ray Dalio. Uh, and and really directly, so that's that's really yes privileged. But you know you can't always. But it, it's also important to have also people who are I would say it's not that they are not telling the truth. That you know we are clients, so right. so you have always a reality which is biased in a way. So it's important yeah. also to talk to people who are not you have not direct relationships and direct commercial relationships with. So political environment is interesting, especially outside and especially in the countries that you are uh, not invested in, to have some other views about uh, the way they are 
perceiving what you do and what the others uh, do. Um, and, 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 and once more, also people coming from different industries. So I, I, I like that, talking to people who are facing sometimes more difficult uh, uh, issues, problems. It's, it's a way also to, to, um, to you know, re redesign your priorities. To, to not be uh, like overwhelmed by your 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 own worries and your day to day, but to say, okay, step, uh, just keep the distance, the right distance with the reality. And what it helps me a lot, to be honest, is to have a family. I have three boys at home, 15, 17, 22. Uh, so it's the way to 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 for me to to be grounded and. Uh, and to really get back to what is very, really important. So it's, I think it's, it's very important, especially right now. Mm. Okay. Okay. This is a lot. No, not the last question. Second last question. Um, okay. You have like, say, say $3 million uh, and you can invest it anywhere in Canada, any asset class, but it has to be one choice. Where are you putting it? <laughs> You're not gonna like the answer, but uh, I have a lot also already a lot in Canada. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. And, I'm um, not surprised, by the way. So, uh, so you know, we are. Uh, I would say that we have uh, already one billion, which is committed in different uh, parts of Canada uh, relating to the the capex that we're going to uh, to do in some shopping centers with what we do in the. Uh, in downtown Montreal, where, where you know we, we are redeveloping uh, Place Ville Marie, we, we just redeveloped uh, the Queen Elizabeth, uh, we are redeveloping uh, Eaton Center. So, um, so I have a lot of money uh, working already in, in Canada. <laughs> so it's not, uh, you know, I, I like this country very much. I, I'm a permanent resident and I hope I'm going to be a citizen soon. So right. I'll forget, forget Canada then. But, but the thing is that because of what I told you, and sometimes it's it's that's why it's complicated because you can't just just get rid of, of the the legacy of the reality. I have this portfolio, and I have to deal with it before thinking about doing something else. So, uh, so, so because of what I told you about diversification, I really think that it's uh, I, I shouldn't add too much here because if i do that it's going to be inconsistent with what i told you in terms of this application but yeah. but what is uh very interesting it, is that i'm talking to a lot of people who are really interested in canada because they, they're you know it's you, you maybe you do not realize that but it's a very close country for investment because mm. if you look around we're among peers it's oxford it's uh cadillac fairview it's uh you know it's it's uh, BCIMC, it's Quadrille, yeah. so it's yeah. you're more, you're talking to uh, really to a very uh, short number of people. So that's really it's, what is really interesting is that Canada is something which makes a lot of foreign investments investors dream, and especially right now because it seems to be safer and under a better governance than a lot of countries under the pandemic. So, so uh, I hope that I'm going to be able to use that, but I can tell you that Canada is very attractive for a lot of people. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is, so this is the last question. We're coming up on an hour. So really appreciate your time here, Natalie. Uh, okay. Imagine years from now, um, you live a long and, and super successful life and you, and you, and you live to be 120, you know, what, you know, you, you, you <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 for whatever reason, it's it's your last day, and your family is around you, and your friends are around you, and all the people that love you. Um, but all of the information that you've put out, every podcast that you've done, the books that you've written, they've all been erased. Uh, and you only have three short notes to pass on to your friends and family and the people who love you. Uh, what do you put on those notes? Um, trust, trust you. I, I really think that the the, the the main thing I've learned uh, over the, the years is uh, I should have listened to myself more often. Mm -hmm. you, you, and especially right now, I think intuition is more important than brain. So uh, I, it's what I'm trying to, to say to my, my children too. When, when you have this little voice telling you something, listen to it. Then 
add some other things, but listen to it. So I, I, I would say that. I hope that uh, if it's my last day and that everybody knows, I, I would have a lot of people uh, sending me uh, uh, good memories of, of the past. What is the most important thing for me is the people you, you can meet and, and the, the, the relationships you can build. So that, yeah. that's why I really feel privileged being the CEO of this company, not only because of uh, uh, the, the so-called power attached to that. No, the, the most important thing is that it opens so many doors and you can have access to so many people. And uh, so uh, it's uh, for me, it's it's really a privilege. So mm -hmm. I, I hope that I would think about it. I on my uh, 120 birthday, thinking of all the people I met and all those things they 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 have brought to me, uh, leading me to be this uh, uh, senior lady 120. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it's like you being like a puzzle, being a yes, yes, the um, the sum of all those things, all those experiences. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, that's more than the, more than the volume of uh, of numbers or volume of transactions you you would have done. Trust yourself. Value your relationships. What, there's one more. You got to give one more. Um, have fun. Yes. Because you know, um, uh, it's it's also a little bit trivial that I would translate that into other another thing. You know. When you have this kind of job, it's like running a marathon, but at any point you should run a sprint. So mm. if it's not fun, then you run one marathon, not mm. 10. Right. So, uh, so you, you have to feel that what you do is meaningful. And I think when you feel that, then it's fun because you have a lot of uh, a reward doing something which makes sense for you. If you do something which doesn't make sense for you, that at a point you you're just not good at what you do because you are going to give up in a way or another. So you have you have to feel. So for for people it's different. What is meaningful for me is not meaningful for you or for somebody else. So you have to. It's it's also related to the first thing. You have to to listen to yourself and say, okay, what is important for me? What 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 matters? What do I want to leave as a legacy? And and if you know that. Then even the, the the most difficult day when you have to make tough decisions, you think about it and you say, okay, but okay, when I look on the uh, on the horizon, that it, it it makes sense, and I would be able to look back at a point and say, okay, it's okay. I I can look at myself in the mirror and say, okay, it's uh, it's consistent with who I am and what I want to be.